It's time now to move to a topic that is not necessarily just about Wi-Fi, but in this case, it's about wireless in a different band and in a different way, and that's CBRS. Now, you may have heard some about it over the last couple of years, but it is beginning to gain in popularity. I've talked to several people that have implemented projects utilizing CBRS at this point in time, or they're involved in the middle of those projects. And so it's definitely growing in popularity, and it's something we need to continue to learn about as wireless professionals. So in this session, we're going to hear from David Wright on exactly that topic. Well, thanks, Tom. And my thanks also to Jennifer, UC, Jonathan, and the rest of the CWNP for the opportunity. It's great to see the organization um, broadening its scope to include other wireless technologies beyond Wi-Fi, and I'm uh, pleased to be here. For those of you who don't, don't know me, um, I do have a ruckus wireless heritage. Uh, I now work um, at Comscope in the office of the CTO, uh, working on spectrum and standards. I uh, threw in a few of my different um, certification acronyms uh, there on the screen, really to highlight two things. First, that um, when I decided to get back into the tech industry and wireless after a fairly long hiatus, uh, the CWNA was the first certification that I pursued, and it was certainly uh, a good thing that I did that and um, led me to led me to this opportunity at Ruckus, which has brought me to where I am today. So I'm grateful to CWNP for that. Uh, the other reason I threw those acronyms up there was just to kind of point out that um, aside from the CPI, they're a little bit rusty. Um, I would say my CCIE is probably older than some of you are. It's been a lot of time, uh, many years since I've de deciphered a PCAP or anything like that. Um, but uh, so, you know, this may not be the most technical session you attend um, at uh, the Wireless Tech Forum. Uh, I know Andrew Von Nagy is doing a session Friday um, uh, on CBRS. I expect that'll be a little bit more technical if you would like to get that um, itch scratched. And uh, I am also the president of the CBRS Alliance, although today I'll be speaking as um, uh, in my Comscope capacity. So, um, you know, I knew that CBRS was a big deal when in the uh, lead up to this event, I saw that um, Somebody was saying that Keith Parsons was now the managing director for a CBRS oriented company. I was like, wow, that's that's big news. Of course, you know, Keith pretty quickly came out and said, no, yeah, sorry, uh, isn't true. I, yes, Keith has been, you know, getting more and more involved in CBRS, uh, obtained his CPI, uh, but he's not a managing director at Solona after all. So the guilty will remain nameless in terms of who put that out. But um, anyways, it's a bit of social media fun for sure. Um, so what is the big deal for real? Well, I don't think it's a, an overstatement to make the claim that what we're talking about is really the you know, democratization of the cellular uh, ecosystem. And there's two key enablers for this transformation that's going on. The first is around access to spectrum, which in the US is the uh, Citizens Broadband Radio Service in the 3.5 band. Um, so that's what we'll be talking about today. Uh, abroad, um, you've got countries in Europe and South America that are also opening up um, cellular oriented frequencies, typically in the 3.4 to 4.2 gigahertz band, uh, also in the 2.6 gigahertz band in France uh, in particular. And they're opening these uh, frequency ranges up for private uh, enterprise industrial type use cases. So, you know, access to spectrum, uh, it all starts there. I think we know pretty well that, uh, you know, in 1985, when the FCC opened the uh, 24 ISM bands for unlicensed operations, what that enabled, um, and, uh, and 35 years of, uh, of transformative impact that we've seen from um, you know, unlicensed and then Wi-Fi is, uh, is evidence of that. And it's my suspicion that we'll look back in 15 or 20 years and, and really see the same kinds of impacts um, you know, based on, on what's happening today with these cellular frequencies being opened. Now, what's interesting also is that it's being accompanied by a transformation in the, you know, 
in the equipment ecosystems and architectures uh, for cellular solutions as well. So the fact that you've got the, the broadening of the ecosystem to encompass different use cases beyond just mobile broadband, but to include things like fixed wireless, private and building uh, cellular coverage, all of that is leading to, you know, uh, again, new players coming into the ecosystem. Um, the fact that we're doing this in frequency ranges that are globally harmonized for LTE or 5G operations means that we're achieving you know, unit volumes at the chipset and equipment levels, not measured in, you know, thousands or tens of thousands, but in, you know, millions, tens, or even hundreds of millions in some cases when you start talking about handsets uh, and chipsets for those handsets. So all of that leads to lower costs, more com competition, and, uh, you know, solutions that make sense for, um, you know, not just the Fortune 500 or the industrial uh, manufacturers and, uh, transportation and energy companies, but also for, um, you know, smaller Fortune 5000 type entities uh, where, where they have needs that are not being met by the current offerings. Um, it's also worth pointing out that this is being accompanied by uh, different sort of emerging models for open architectures and virtualization in the cellular, um, in the cellular network. So the first part of that is open RAN which is really the standardization of open and interoperable interfaces between the various RAN components. So everything from the active radio units to the digital units, uh, back to the central units. Um, and so there's a lot of work underway around that to, to ensure that, um, you know, you can mix and match those components from different vendors, um, that, uh, you know, that the, the, the um, capabilities are still there, um, but you've got more competition in the RAN space. So that's open RAN. Then RAN virtualization is really just the idea of that, um, much as we saw with uh, wireless LAN controllers going from, um, you know, proprietary software running on proprietary hardware, um, that uh, we now have um, a lot of the functions in the cellular RAN being virtualized and implemented as VNFs or containers on um, you know, commercial off-the-shelf hardware, typically x86 servers. So again, we've seen these parallels uh, in the you know, wireless LAN arena for some time, and now it's occurring in cellular also. And I have included some information at the back of the presentation, so hopefully you'll have a time to go and, and look at those, uh, those links and those slides if you're interested. But this is a transformative moment, um, you know, with cellular, uh, both with the access to spectrum and then these other trends around open interfaces and virtualization. And, um, you know, I encourage everybody to, you know, even if you're not planning on jumping into CBRS, you should be following these things in terms of the impacts that will likely come from it and the opportunities that will come out of it. So I thought it would be worth dealing right up front with a question that I get a lot, which is, won't CBRS kill the Wi-Fi? And thought it was worth taking a kind of stroll down memory lane. These are some headlines that I've seen over the last four or five years. Everything from you know, mobile is overtaking Wi-Fi, CBRS threatens, Wi-Fi is going to replace cellular. It's an interesting turn. Will 5G kill Wi-Fi? And then you know, unlimited mobile uh, is causing people to, to use less Wi-Fi. So we've seen all these sort of proclamations about who's going to kill whom. Um, and, uh, and maybe it was best summed up with this headline, which just asked, is 5G going to kill us all? Maybe we can stop worrying about these other things because 5G is a mortal threat. Well, I do think that, um, you know, all these years later, Michael Palin had it right. Let's not bicker and argue about who killed who. And, uh, yeah. That's, that's the reality. While you know, we have the sensational headlines, we have the people kind of searching for clicks and coverage and eyeballs. Um, the reality is that, you know, we live in an increasingly wireless world. Um, we need uh, all of these different types of spectrum uh, allocation me methods, whether it's licensed, unlicensed, or shared. We need Wi-Fi, we need LTE and 5G, um, and we need those things operating uh, in both licensed bands as well as in shared spectrum bands. 
I was talking at a uh, an NTI spectrum symposium recently, and I was talking about the pandemic and um, how we have uh, been trying to help out the educational community. And one of the things that we've been doing is uh, putting um, you know, Wi-Fi access points on school buses. And um, you know, since the school buses aren't being used to take students to, to the school buildings in many uh, places, they're taking the buses out, parking them in the community and letting kids uh, you know, have access to the, um, uh, the, the internet uh, that way through essentially a public hotspot. Well, you know, the bus doesn't have a fiber running to it, right? So what's the backhaul? Well, it's almost invariably an LTE link um, that we do with a module. So here you have a great example of licensed and unlicensed Wi-Fi and LTE working together to solve, uh, you know, a current need that we have. And, um, you know, we've also been using CBRS uh, to help meet school connectivity needs during the pandemic. So. You know, to my mind, it's not a zero sum game. It's not a matter of anyone killing anyone or, you know, CBRS gaining at the expense of Wi Fi or the traditional mobile cellular networks. This is a new tool. Uh, we need them all. And, um, you know, we, we need to move beyond these sensationalist headlines and, and figure out how best to work together. So getting a little bit more into the heart of the matter, uh, for those of you who aren't familiar with CBRS, it's a three-tiered sharing framework um, in the 150 to, excuse me, 150 megahertz from 3550 to 3700 uh, megahertz. And the reason we call it a three-tier framework is you've got incumbents at tier one who we continue to protect and operate around. And then we're introducing two new tiers of commercial service uh, as underlays to those. Um, priority access uh, licensees will have um, 70 access to 70 megahertz or up to 70 megahertz of the overall 150 megahertz in each geographic region that they're licensed for, which is the county level. Um, and uh, you know, I'll get into that a little bit more when we talk about the options. Um, but uh, what's sort of most important to understand here is that um, any of the spectrum that's not being used, any of the 150 megahertz that's not being used by a tier one incumbent or a tier two priority access licensee is available for general authorized use. So some people compare this to um, unlicensed use. It, you know, it holds to a, a certain degree, I'm not uh, thrilled with that analogy. But um, you know, it is similar to unlicensed to, to the extent that it's open to anyone. Um, the way that this is all enabled is via a, um, a, a coordination database is essentially what it is. So the spectrum access system is the, uh, is the heart of the CBRS framework. Um, this is a, a cloud database that's, or actually I should say it's cloud databases, plural operated by a number of entities that have been um, you know, approved by the FCC to provide this service. And they're responsible for understanding the RF environment in a given location and authorizing those CBRS tiers of operation, both the GA and the PAL tier that we talked about on the previous slide, while protecting the incumbents at tier one. So you see in this uh, diagram on the left, the um, the SASs, uh, you know, the SASs talk to one another, which is the SAS to SAS interface, but then they also talk to the um, uh, incumbent data stores. So the FCC databases that have uh, information about the fixed satellite and um, and uh, and fixed wireless access providers who are incumbents in the band, as well as what's known as the ESC, which is essentially a sensor network deployed along the coast, which looks for the um, uh, radar signatures of the uh, uh, the shipborne radars that uh, that we're protecting. So you know, it's the inputs from those databases in the sensor networks that allows the SASs to protect the tier one incumbents. They then receive requests from the uh, CBRS radios, which we call CBSDs. Tried to get them to call them WAPs, but couldn't convince the FCC to do that. Just kidding. That was for uh, that was for Keith and Lee in particular. But um, in CBRS, we call the the radio CBSDs. The CBSDs have to register in with the SASs. They provide information about you know what type of CBSD they are, what their location is, their FCC ID. Uh, if they're operating at the PAL tier, they also uh, provide the appropriate credentials to attest that they. Um, 
are indeed operated by a PAL licensee in that county. And then they make a request for spectrum uh, to the SAS. The SAS then again, looks at the overall environment in that location and returns a spectrum grant um, to the CBSD, which is then utilized for its operation. So this is, uh, this is database coordination. Um, if, uh, I'm not sure if Chuck's already talked about the um, six gigahertz uh, band and what's going on there, but um, you know, the AFC and six gigahertz uh, you know, it plays a similar role, certainly much more simplistic what we're doing in six gigahertz, but you know, you're all gonna be understanding more about database coordination going forward, I suspect. Um, and, uh, you know, I would also just mention that, you know, this is an area where the U.S. is really showing a lot of leadership internationally around spectrum sharing and this database coordination. In fact, Fred Moorfield from the uh, DOD CIO's office was talking about, you know, our, our leadership in spectrum sharing is a national security imperative. Maintaining that leadership, extending it is a national security imperative. So, you know, this is a priority for, you know, not only commercial operations, but for the federal users going forward. It's one of the ways that we're going to get more access to Spectrum going forward is finding ways to share effectively. Uh, so, you know, it, it's something everybody should be keeping an eye on and staying attuned with. Um, in terms of the CBSDs or the radios, there's two categories, essentially, uh, category A, category B. I'm not going to read the details. You know, essentially one is more Wi-Fi like category A, category B is more of sort of Pico cellular 50 watts uh, outdoor only. Um, and then there's essentially a third classification, which is, you know, customer prem uh, equipment, CBSD, which essentially just allows you to operate at higher power than you can as a station or as a client uh, to close the link on a point to point link. Um, and then once that link has been closed or established, then the, the remote node uh, registers as a CBSD, uh, Cat A or Cat B, and is then subject to the, the requirements um, and the possibilities of, uh, of operation as a Cat A or Cat B. Uh, but those are the three types of CBSDs that we have in CBRS. It's important to understand the roles of two organizations, industry organizations. We've got the Wireless Innovation Forum or WIN Forum which has done all the foundational work to enable the CBRS framework. And, and it, that work has happened, you know, and how the, how the SASs will talk to one another, how they will protect the incumbents, how the SASs will communicate to the CBSDs, you know, how do CBSDs register? How do they request spectrum grants? You know, what's the heartbeat mechanism between the radios and the database? All of that work has happened in Wind Forum and it happened, you know, again, irrespective of what air interface technology you're using. So, I mean, it could have been WiMAX, it could be LTE, it could be 5G, it could be something proprietary. WinForum hasn't concerned itself with that. It's just operationalized the CBRS framework. Um, you know, there's the major work areas they've gone into, including things like the you know, PKI uh, system to secure all the communication, the CPI program to uh, get these things installed. Um, and then they've done a lot of technical collaboration with the FCC, NTI, and DOD. Um, in contrast, you've got the CBRS Alliance, um, which came along a little bit later to look specifically at enabling and optimizing LTE and 5G in CBRS. There are major work activities, uh, including a marketing function. So that would be one of the big distinctions between WinForum and CBRS Alliances. You know, we are out evangelizing um, this band to end users and what the capabilities and the solutions are. We've got a, uh, a brand that we're driving interoperability and product uh, development uh, and marketing around called OnGo. Um, you see the logo for there. And um, in our relationships with the government, you know, extend into advocacy, especially advocacy around availability of the band, which, you know, we're actually essentially right at the finish line now with the PAL tier. But, uh, but we have been pushing hard with you know, all of our government partners for many years to get this band commercialized and opened up uh, for service. And now you know, talking about how to leverage it going forward. Very brief history. This is a, a really just a, a snapshot, but um, you know, we've talked about some of this. Uh, the last year has been really, really uh, you know, important. We got the initial commercial deployment launch last September. We had the GAA tier fully authorized in January of this year. 
we just completed the PAL auctions and we expect to see the PALs, <clears throat> excuse me, put into service and you know, around the end of the year would be my estimate. And that will essentially be, you know, the full implementation of the CBRS framework once we see the PAL tier go into service. CBRS Alliance, uh, we're actually at about 180 members now, um, up from six founding members. You can see, you know, the names there, I'm not gonna read them. Um, many enterprise wireless LAN uh, you know, providers seeing opportunities now around uh, private LTE, private 5G. We've also got cellular infrastructure vendors, chipset companies, um, you know, tier one mobile network operators, the leading um, cable operators in the country, WISPs, tower companies, you know, uh, lots of folks. So, and I think that the membership of the Alliance really reflects sort of the diversity and the opportunities and use cases, everything from mobile broadband to fixed wireless access to private um, enterprise and industrial private cellular applications. And then also the opportunity to provide you know, in-building cellular coverage. So sort of what, you know, people have done with DAS systems and stadiums and shopping malls and airports, um, you know, for, for some time, the ability to, you know, do that same sort of in-building cellular, but at a much lower price point leveraging, you know, you know, just regular uh, ethernet and fiber infrastructure um, to connect small cell nodes and, and, and to do that in a more, you know, classical Wi-Fi type deployment model. Um, so again, yeah, lots of members. I think Wi-Fi Alliance right now, if I'm not mistaken, is just is between 800 and 900 members. So I think the fact that in, you know, four years, we've put together 180 members for a US specific opportunity I'm really pleased by this. I'm really grateful to our members and, and it's been a, a fun ride so far. It's been a busy year. As I mentioned, we got the, uh, the uh, GA ICD authorization about a year ago. In that time, we've deployed you know, many, towns, many tens of thousands of CBSDs, both category A and category B, indoor, outdoor, the range of use cases. Um, the, the numbers on the right are actually a little bit dated. If, uh, so these are a little bit higher. Um, but you know, 90 plus different uh, models of CBSD that the FCC has authorized. Over 120 different client devices have been authorized. And that again, kind of runs the gamut, everything from handsets to tablets, to notebooks, to customer prem equipment, to IOT modules, both, you know, kind of consumer grade, ruggedized, um, you know, industrial uh, devices, um, security cameras, barcode scanners, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So, the, the types of clients that are becoming available for the band is also an endorsement of the use cases um, and its applicability. Now I've got five authorized SaaS admins, about almost 2,000 uh, CPIs. And then in January, the Alliance put out its release three specs which support 5G and our operation in the band. Probably heard uh, maybe about this PAL auction that, uh, that wrapped up recently. Um, Bottom line, you know, as the chairman said, you know, it was a unequivocal resounding success. And I don't know how anybody could, could view it otherwise. Um, you know, about $4.6 billion was raised, 228 bidders secured licenses at the auction. You know, these were some of the top um, uh, bidders that, that one sorted by the, uh, the gross proceeds um, that they committed to, but uh, you know, I'm extremely happy about, you know, the, the auction. Um, you know, there was one story that I think just came out in the last couple of weeks about, you know, the enterprise quote unquote participation wasn't what some people had expected. Honestly, in my opinion, for a county size license that you'd have to buy for 10 years, I'm not overly surprised that in the middle of a global pandemic, we didn't have more enterprise participation. But that kind of leads me into the next topic I wanted to touch on, which is the secondary markets for the priority access licenses. I'm going to use my county here in Durham, North Carolina as an example. And, you know, if, uh, if we're looking at an operator who might have achieved uh, or obtained one of the PALs at the auction, they're likely going to deploy some radios, what, maybe along the major, um, you know, uh, interstates and then in some of the more dense uh, urban areas that we have in Durham. Not that we're an incredibly, you know, dense area, but we do have some in the city and then in Research Triangle. So, you know, these are the areas that I think you can see a, an operator typically looking to deploy, you know, their CBSDs or their radios. 
And what's important to understand is that um, what the SAS is obligated to do is to protect, you know, a boundary, a protection contour around the CBSD, you know, calculated on whether it's cat A or cat B, and then, you know, uh, other operational characteristics, its height, its antenna, et cetera. Um, but, um, you know, the SAS uses all of that information to calculate a PAL protection area, right? And that's what's supposed to be high, you know, sort of depicted in these shaded bubbles. So um, anything outside of the PAL protection area within the license area, which in this case would be Durham County, is available for GAA use, right? So if the SAS has assigned this PAL license uh, to, let's call it 3560 to 3570, right? Well, that's great. They have exclusive rights to 3560 to 3570 anywhere that's pink on this map. But anywhere outside of the pink areas, 3560 to 3570 is available for general authorized use, right? So why wouldn't that license holder, and keep in mind, we're only looking at one license holder, there can be up to four PAL, uh, excuse me, there can be up to, um, well, they're going to, in most counties, there's going to be multiple PAL license holders, right? Because you can own, own, one entity can only have uh, 40 megahertz of PAL or four channels uh, of the seven total. So in most counties, there are going to be at least two, if not more, license holders. And we're only looking at one here in this, uh, in this illustration. But um, priority access licensees can utilize two different approaches to potentially lease their spectrum. There's what's called the factor transfer leasing. It's a sort of more traditional leasing approach. And then there's spectrum manager leasing. And importantly, the commission put in place a, 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 essentially a new form of um, streamlined uh, spectrum management leasing called light touch leasing. And this allows the SAS, it leverages the SAS um, and allows people who are interested in getting PAL rights to go get pre-certified with the FCC and then go find um, PAL rights, unused PAL rights um, from one of the license holders and then execute a lease. Um, it, all of this can be uh, sort of consummated by the SAS. The SAS then goes back and, um, and notifies the FCC that the lease is in effect. And then the FCC can do a retrospective review, but it's actually already taken effect. So it allows for very quick um, leasing of PAL rights. And these leases can be for any duration and really for any geographic um, coverage area up to the extent of the, the license area, obviously, and, and the duration can be up to the 10 years. But if you've got a short term requirement, you've got a, a very localized um, need, you know, I think this speaks to sort of events and enterprise needs. Um, you know, I think it's natural that this light touch leasing is going to be utilized because as a license holder, I'm not going to use the spectrum, and if uh, other people can use it at GA without paying me anything, why wouldn't I want to recoup some of that? And I've, I've got to use a SAS already to, you know, authorize my PAL operation so they know where my radios are. It would be easy enough for me just to say, okay, here's where I'm deploying, and I'd be interested in lease, you know, offers, uh, offers for leasing uh, outside of those areas. And, you know, the SAS very logically can play sort of a market making brokering function for those lease rights. So I, I think we're going to see this emerge. I think it's going to be different than traditional cellular leasing, which has really been sort of just the national players leasing to the regional players. I think this truly could be, um, you know, impactful to the enterprise and, and smaller players. And again, just keep in mind that, you know, uh, you know PAL channels are available by default for GA anywhere outside of the uh, PPAs. Real quickly, wanted to touch on certified professional installers. This is a critical enabling role. I didn't really get into it on the, um, the CBSD slide, but all category B higher power CBSDs and virtually all of the category A CBSDs today require a CPI or a certified professional installer um, to you know, uh, validate their location, validate the um, operating parameters of that CBSD and then enter that information um, into a database, which you know informs the SASs, uh, you know, uh, on the RF environment, and, and uh, you know, it's critical to to them making good um, spectrum allocation decisions. So there's a, a big need for CPIs. I mentioned we have about you know, 1,900 in the community today. Expect that to grow. Uh, if you're interested in becoming a CPI, it's really just a matter of doing some computer-based training, passing an exam. 
and then getting a PKI credential that allows you to enter um, information. Uh, CBRS, excuse me, uh, WinForum administers the, uh, the PKI program. Um, they've authorized five different companies to provide uh, CPI training. You can see them there. And I've actually included the, uh, the link to the Comscope CPI in my additional resources. But um, yeah, with that, I'll, I'll just wrap up. I want to just conclude by saying again, I really do think that um, you know, CBRS, private LTE, uh, private cellular, and you know, tied to what's going on with open RAN and RAN virtualization, this is all just sort of, we're, we're at a cusp of a new era in, in the broadening of cellular. And for those of you in the CWMP community, I think, you know, uh, it behooves you to pay attention to what's going on and to gauge for yourself where you th whether you think there are opportunities in private cellular. Um, you know, to my mind, a lot of the delivery of these solutions to the end users, to the enterprises themselves, you know, it, it, there's more commonality with the Wi-Fi community and, and, and how we've delivered Wi-Fi solutions than to the cellular community, uh, or the historical cellular community, because that has been very tailored to meeting the needs of, you know, the, the very large um, uh, national level mobile network operators. Um, and I'm not saying that, you know, those companies or those integrators who are focused on that won't have some play in the private space. I'm sure that they will, but they certainly won't be able to do it all. And they probably don't have the, you know, the sector expertise that a lot of people working with, you know, higher ed or healthcare or education or whatever, you know, vertical, they may be hospitality, um, they may be focusing on have in a Wi-Fi context. So uh, definitely think there are opportunities here. Glad CWMP is, um, you know, uh, starting to, to look into this for your members. And um, yeah, at Comscope, we look forward to, uh, to, you know, continuing to help out and um, thank you again. Great. All right, I'm here with Dave Wright. Dave, welcome, glad to have you with us today. How are you doing today, Dave? Oh, thanks. Oh, no, uh, it thanks. looks, like, it looks it. like we're having some technical difficulties. Dave, you might wanna, let's just turn off your video and just do audio so they can get this great content. Okay. All right. All right. So audio only. Yep. I can hear you. Can you hear me? I can hear you just fine. Excellent. Let's go forward with it then. So we do have a few questions that have come in. First of all, well, uh, uh, Jennifer, Jennifer Manila asks, how could CBRS private LTE impact the dispute with organizations or campuses that carriers want to do LAA or similar technology that may disrupt Wi-Fi? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so, I mean, I think that, uh, you know, anybody who's concerned about um, a, an operator who wants to come in and deploy an LIA capability that would obviously, you know, take up capacity, the gigahertz band, um, you know, a, a good counter to that would be to suggest that they look at a, um, you know, a small cell solution operating in CBRS where they can, you know, harness, yeah, 10, 40, 80 megahertz of, uh, of discrete spectrum, use that for uh, you know, increasing the capacity of the cellular signal there in the cellular network without utilizing your five gigahertz spectrum. So I would certainly uh, make that argument if uh, an operator came knocking on my door. Okay, excellent. And the other question that we have is, um, what should I think about with CBRS and a campus environment? And they also indicate that their cell coverage is suboptimal there. Yeah, a, a great, another good question. Um, I mentioned this sort of, you know, use case of, of CBRS for in-building cellular, which, you know, you'll hear called neutral host or third-party operator, or, you know, various terms, but it's the idea that, you know, an entity can deploy a CBRS small cell network uh, potentially use it for their internal connectivity needs in a, in a truly private uh, mode of operation, but then also, you know, open up that same footprint to the subscribers of the mobile network operators. And, and this 
is again where you'd see a DAS or distributed antenna system uh, solutions. And, you know, we've had those in stadium shopping malls, airports for, for quite a long time, but they haven't made economic sense um, in a lot of places. And so, you know, that's one of the things that we're trying to satisfy with uh, CBRS. I think you're going to see some pretty compelling announcements later this year about enterprises meeting uh, or providing better in-building cellular uh, with CBRS into the year. Okay, excellent. Well, there was one more thing that uh, we had talked about earlier, you and I, that you wanted to address with the audience. Um, we were talking about Chuck's uh, six gigahertz presentation, and you said there was something interesting you wanted to share with the group. So do you want to talk about that for just a moment before we go? Yeah, just real quickly. Thanks, Tom. Um, yeah, Chuck did a great job yesterday. I just want to make sure everybody, if you haven't seen it on social media, there was a, a, an important ruling. I mean, relatively important. We, we were expecting it, but the uh, the D.C. Circuit Court um, dismissed the motion or rejected the motion that some um, people had filed or some entities had filed to stay or kind of suspend the uh, implementation of the FCC's uh, order, which Chuck pointed out was uh, went into effect July 27th. So, you know, that action by people opposed to six gigahertz on license was rejected by the Circuit Court today. That's so that, right. So we get a, to keep it. That's a good thing. <laughs> Exactly. All right. Excellent. Well, Dave, hey, I apologize for the technical difficulties, but we were so glad to have you with us today and for the presentation. Appreciate all the effort and thank you very much for joining us. Thank you, Tom. Thanks to CWMP. All right. Take care. Okay.